This is the EWN Podcast Network. Welcome to Late Boomers, our podcast guide to creating your third act with style, power, and impact. Hi, I'm Kathy Worthington. And I'm Mary Elkins. Join us as we bring you conversations with successful entrepreneurs, entertainers, and people with vision who are making a difference in the world. Everyone has a story, and we'll take you along for the ride on each interview, recounting the journey our guests have taken to get where they are, inspiring you to create your own path to success. Let's get started. Hello, I'm Kathy Worthington. Welcome to our newest episode of Late Boomers. Today, our guest is Danielle Orsino, fantasy author, martial artist, and cosplayer. She is the award-winning author of The Birth of the Fae. Before that, she was involved with martial arts and a nursing career. And I'm Mary Elkins. Danielle, as a cosplayer, has appeared on all the covers of her books as her character, Fae. Because of this, she now has a following of Fay Natics. She's done a masterful job of world building in her books, and we hope you'll enjoy our discussion with her today. Welcome, Danielle. Thank you so much for having me, ladies. I'm so excited to be here and chat all about things Fay. And it's great I'm, to have you. And I know you, for those of, of our audience that are watching on YouTube, you are dressed as Fay today, which you frequently do. And that's part of the cosplay thing that we're going to talk about. And I know it's a real interesting story about how you became an author and what led up to it. So tell us about your background and your inspiration for that. I started out as a martial artist, transferred into nursing because the joke is, you know, once you beat them up, you got to patch them up. (laughs) So I I made that transition into nursing uh, after, you know, competing in martial arts and competing professionally, fighting forms, that whole thing. Uh, The last thing I did was I competed and represented Team USA under the WKA flag uh, at the World Championships in Disney World. Uh, I won a silver medal. And when I was done with that, I decided I'm good. I've kind of uh, done my dream. And I left. That made that my last uh, hurrah and went into nursing. Mm -hmm. After a couple of years in nursing, I went to a Lyme disease clinic. And I found Lyme disease fascinating because it's the great imitator of diseases. And there I met an interesting patient who we started the same day. He, it was his first day dripping, my first day working there. And we struck up a friendship. After about a year and a half, he just didn't want to do it anymore. He had transferred his whole life to Westchester County from Pennsylvania. And uh, he'd driven five hours. And, you know, he was just done. Mm-hmm. So he wanted to go back home. Don't blame him. And our protocol was very strict. You dripped every day for anywhere from about 45 minutes to two hours, Uh seven days a week, Christmas, New Year's, you name it, we were there. And so he struck up a deal with the doctor and said, basically, let me go home. And what I will do is I will drive up on a Wednesday, five hours, I will drip for two hours and turn around and go home. Then I will return on Friday. I will stay Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, I will drip turn and go to work. And then I'll do this all over again. I knew this wasn't going to last, but I was like, yeah, sure. Whatever. Uh, and it lasted about three weeks before he was like, I don't want to do this. So we were chatting one day and he was like, look, Danny, keep me in this chair or else I'm going home. I'm done with this. So we struck up a conversation and I said, well, tell me something interesting about yourself. And what came out of it was he was like, well, I was recruited by the CIA out of college. I don't know if you find this interesting. And I'm like, how did I not know this after a year and a half? How did this not come up with all the times you've sat in this chair? And so he told me it was the, for the trends and intentions division. It was basically an analyst. And that just sparked this whole little conversation between conspiracy theories and, you know, Roswell and whatever. And so uh, we joked about basically what he could have done in the CIA and things like that. And out of my mouth came, um, well, you know where Lyme comes from? And he was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, Plum Island went down that rabbit hole of conspiracy theories. And I just said, no, for some reason, I said the Fae. Don't know why I wasn't reading any books about fairies. It wasn't, you know, I was on a vampire kick as most of us, you know, get. (laughs) And he went, well, who are the Fae? And I don't know what happened. But from there, I just started telling him this story off the top of my head about fairies. 
being locked out of heaven, the CIA agent who was stuck in a Lyme clinic to find out if there was a fey human hybrid at his nurse. And I just started telling him a story. And every day he sat down, I told him another piece of it, and I put him in the story as the CIA agent. And we just started going. And that's really how the whole thing started. And we that's went from genius. there. Mm-hmm. I didn't think much of it. I was just kind of mm-hmm. off the top of my head telling him a story. And that's where it all really came from. That's so great. And unbelievable. And that is Turn wonderful. it into a series of books. That's a brilliant way to use it. Yeah. I didn't, I never thought it was going to go down. It was actually the patient who was like, you need to go home and write this down. He kept pushing me. And I was like, I'm going to physician assistant school. Like I already started my pre regs I put a lot of money into my degree. I don't have time to go be a fantasy author. Like I thought he was the crazy one. And it was so funny because he thought I was the nutty one for wanting to go to physician assistant school. Like we were both battling each other Mm -hmm. on who had the crazier idea. And he was like, what are you doing? This is such a good idea. And I'm like, no, no, no. I'm going to go pump some faces full of wrestling. And, (laughs) you know, I don't have time to be an author. Mm -hmm. And he was like, you're making a mistake. And he was just laughing. So we were, we both thought the other one was crazy and we would just go back and forth on this. But I I never thought I was going to wind up being an author. That was the, like the last thing on my mind. I was taking finals and doing other things. Uh So it's kind of weird where it all wound up. And that had to be so healing for him. It really, it was very funny because we're still friends to this very day. Like I just talked to him 10 minutes before this podcast. We're still friends. And he he laughs about it because what started out as this series was me telling him the story, putting him in it. And now I'm six books, seven books in his actual story comes out in volume two. So he laughs because he's like, when does Graham show up? When does agent Graham show up? That's his persona. <laughs> and it's at the end of book six that he, he makes his literary you know, appearance. And we just <laughs> joke because it's like, look how far we've come. Right. And all of this. Right. So it's, it's really funny. Well, that is a great story unto itself. Now you're on the cover of your books. So what is what is it like to be on the cover of a fantasy book? And how did that come about? That was completely unplanned. <laughs> Once again, not something I foresaw. Um it was kind of, it's a limited edition thing that uh my publisher Four Horsemen did just to kind of test it out when I first came to them and they signed me. Originally, I had this, you know, most authors have this whole idea of what the covers of the books are going to be like, and they have this grand plan of, well, it's going to be this, and the color means that, you know, and I came with that whole thing, too. And um, Valerie Willis, who's the COO, saw what I originally planned, which was just typeset, and she was like, you know, I saw these pictures of you cosplaying. She's like, what are you doing with those? And I said, oh, I think it's for a magazine. I don't know what they're doing. She goes, but do you own those pictures? I said, well, yeah, I, yeah, I own them. She's like, give me 24 hours and we'll talk. I was like, all right, great. And the next day they had a meeting with me. It was um, Valerie and Erica Lance, who's the CEO. And there I was on the cover of Locked Out of Heaven as a mermaid. And she's like, this is our idea. And I was like, uh, okay. She's like, we're putting you on the cover. Oh. She's like, for the first run, we're just going to put you on the cover. And we're just going to see what happens. They said, it's, it, you know, it hasn't been done. Let's just try it for the first run. And I was like, okay, why? And they said, well, it just, it, first of all, it hasn't been done. They said, there's never been a female author fantasy who's also on the covers. Mm-hmm. They said, it, it, it hasn't been done. They said, let's try it. You're a cosplayer. You've already done it. You've dressed up. Why, why not just try? So I was like, okay, I have some conditions. I said, you can't airbrush me to look 25 because I'm not 25. That was my first condition off the bat. I'm like, I don't want to portray an unrealistic version of myself. Mm -hmm. You know, I said, look, I've got a tail. That's already unrealistic. I said, but you know, I want to keep it. I want to keep ages. I don't want to keep the whole ageism thing. I don't want to make it look like I'm 25 when I'm not. I said, I'm a certain age. Let's at least celebrate it. And they were like, totally on board. We're all women of a certain age. Let's do it. I said, so that's my first thing. And they were like, cool. I said, when it gets to a point where if we're going to keep this going, if I'm going to continue on it and I can't do it anymore, you'll tell me, I'll probably curse you out. You'll send me a pint of Hagen dazs The next day we'll all be friends. And then I have a say in who gets to be on the cover <laughs> after that. 
They were like, cool. But they said, I think we're just going to do it for the first volume. And we're going to do it for like the first couple years. And then we'll see. So I was like, great. So we did it. Um, we've done it up to book six, which is the vo- volume one. Uh, and then, you know, we've decided we're probably going to retool the covers because it was just limited edition. And that was what we had decided was we're going to do it for a little bit and see. It's been a lot of fun. I've loved it. But there is a certain pressure with it mm-hmm. that I don't. It's bad enough I'm being judged for what's on the inside. But now I'm judged for the cover. And we all say, don't judge a book by its cover. We do. <laughs> oh, I mean, yeah. Let's be honest. We do. I know, but it's so wonderful. Yeah. But I have to ask well, you. When you're on the cover, yeah. too, it's a lot. So Yeah. But I have to ask I'm you, thinking. is it? Is it maybe this touches on that a little bit, but is it awkward or difficult being a female in the fantasy world? Female author, not necessarily the cover, but is that an issue yes. for you? It it was a lot. Um, it's very weird because when I first started and when I was querying, a lot of people wanted me to change my name. They wanted me to go by my initials. So people did not know I was a female. Ah. Everything was, can you make it DM or C no? And I was like, well, why? And they were like, we don't want people to know you're a female because I was told originally I could not be young adult because I dealt with, I was violent because I'm a martial artist. So of course I write great fight scenes. That's what I do. You know, uh-huh. I'm, I'm a martial artist. I'm going to write good fight scenes. So they didn't want me to identify as female. They didn't want anybody to know. I don't have a lot of love in the beginning. I don't write romanticy. That's not my thing. So I was told you cannot be a young adult. Um, and because I'm violent and I deal with very, not heavy topics, but topics that make you think there's a lot of political intrigue. There's more coming of age things. I was told you can't be young adult. So I took myself out of the category and my first publisher was like, yeah, no, you can't be young adult. It wasn't until I got to four horsemen that they were like, look, we'll give this whole, you can't be young adult for like a year. They were like, but we're telling you you're young adult. And so it was very hard. Now, as I've gone on, people are like, why aren't you in young adult? And I've even had bookstores who are like, I would prefer you're in young adult than some of the young adult people I have in there because you don't have sex. Uh They were like, please let us put you in young adult because your topics are much more realistic. You know, you have these angels that are trying to figure out who they are. Uh They were like, this is perfect for young adult. They were like, let us put you in it. So I just was at a Barnes and Noble who um, the manager was like, I would rather have you in there than Sarah J. Moss. Mm -hmm. They said, because there's so much sex in her book. They said, versus you who has a slow burn romance and the sex that you have, which I call it aura blending. They said, the way you describe it with battle terms is so funny and humorous. I would rather have you there than have these parents come back yelling at me for the smut they're reading. Yeah. Because the young adults would still appreciate what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And so I finally have made that switch to new adult, young adult. Mm-hmm. And Great. Four Horsemen's kind of looking at me going, uh, we told you. Mm-hmm. But I was told for so long by others, you can't do this. You're a female. You need romance. You need this. And you write such violent fight scenes. No, no, no. That there's such a double standard. Mm-hmm. Because if I was a man, nobody would be looking at me twice for writing good fight scenes or saying I'm angry or asking mm-hmm. me to change my name. Yeah. But as a female. It was change your name. Can you just go by initials, which I never yeah. did. I was like, I'm keeping my name. So it, it's been very odd in that sense. Yeah. But things are changing now, wouldn't you say? Not as fast as you'd like them. There's not as many female voices in strict fantasy. Mm-hmm. They're in romanticy. They're in yeah. young adult. But even then, there's always somebody kind of nudging you. Like, can you put a little more romance? Can you? Can you give me a female lead that's looking for for a guy and I'm like, or looking for somebody and I'm looking at him going, my chick is building a, a, a kingdom. My guy is building a kingdom. They do not have time to swipe right or left. <laughs> I'll get there. But right now they just lost their home. They've been kicked out of the shining kingdom. They have no job. They have no life. <laughs> They're not looking to go get a date. Mm-hmm. Like we don't have time for this. Yeah. So it's kind of funny. But, but um, are there a lot of female readers of uh, fantasy, this kind of fantasy? They're coming around. There are more. I have skewed more male for a long time, but I think it's also where I was put and where I was yeah. placed. I'm getting more now. They're coming around to me. 
but originally I was placed in that Game of Thrones, um, Lord of the Rings category. And my men, my male readers especially enjoyed it because they did like the fight scenes. And I have a lot of dragons and they were like, wow, this is really cool. And they appreciated the technicalities and, you know, the technical aspects of my stuff. They really loved. And I don't do big sweeping battle scenes. You will not see 10,000 horses coming down a field like Braveheart with me. Mm -hmm, There's mm -hmm. small fight scenes that are very technically accurate. So that's Mm -hmm. where I picked up a lot of my, my readers. Uh, Any martial artists loved it, and they were like, she got it. Yeah, so I'm getting I more agree. now. Yeah, the reason I asked that question is because um, in, you, you, in, I had thought about asking you about where the inspiration for your book came from, which you've already discussed. And so it occurred to me that perhaps you read a lot of these books or watched things like shows like Game of Thrones in order to even come up with a story like that to tell the the man that you were you were helping at the time. So I had never seen Game of Thrones. Um I didn't read it. I didn't see I didn't even see Game of Thrones till season 6 and I binged it at that point because I didn't want it to influence by the time I heard of it I was already through book 4 and I didn't want it to influence me at all. Mm-hmm. So you never read it when you when you told the man that you were nurse nope. nursing you've never Didn't read it know. it just came out of your brain no nope, it just came out great. to this day the only books i had read that i could say maybe were close was i've read mists of avalon maybe yeah 15 years ago Love i saw book. the yeah. series with juliana margulies when it first was on i don't even know how long ago that was um that was as close as i could get i mean i'm a comic book geek mm-hmm. so even where i pulled some of the character inspirations from were more comic books, right? Than I could say oh. medieval or or fantasy. Mm-hmm. It, it came more from comic books than anything else. That's great. Mm. But tell us what it's like to be on blasphemy lists, and tell us the Ooh. background on that. What's going on with that? Um, blasphemy lists are basically where they call you an enemy of religion. Oh, uh, so mm. I have been on. I'm on two. I'm aiming for a third because I feel like you know. Then you've really made it. Uh, <laughs> you know, you got you got to find the uh. silver lining in that. Uh, my first publisher hit just hit the wrong button basically when they were putting me on in categories, and so because I deal with some religious topics in the sense that you know my fae originally start out as angels who can't go home. You have the virtue angels and the power brigade angels. Uh, mm. They hit Christian fiction by accident. Well, once they do that in the metadata, it's very hard to get it back, you know, from the back end. Yeah. It was just an honest mistake. It wasn't like they were like, oh, watch this, you know, all all publicity is good publicity. It wasn't that. It was just an honest mistake. Unfortunately, some people got a hold of the book thinking it would have a Christian positive message Uh and took it the wrong way. Mm. Once that happened, it was like kindling, match, light. (laughs) And yeah, people took it in other directions. And so it became that I was making fun of the Bible. I was making fun of angels and they went in different directions with it. And um, I just upset oh. the wrong people. You yeah. Know? Some people cannot see a fantasy book for what it is. It's just a fantasy book. And so it just wildfire. And so I started receiving messages that I was angry with God and, whatever i had um there was a youtube video that they were going to petition the vatican to have the book pulled um and i think it was up for maybe an hour before youtube pulled it down um i was on some it was the christian ethics committee it was some christian ethic whatever uh they named me the first person of blasphemy and then others followed like dominoes and then I started getting DMs from it within Instagram that was just like, basically, give us your home address. We want to send you books on basically to repair your relationship with God. And at that point, I started answering with them. At first, I was like really upset. I went through the whole I'm, I'm so upset thing. And then finally, I was like, I started answering them with, you know, cheeky answers like, I'm sorry, Lucifer has not told me what realm of hell we will be living in once we're married. But as soon as he does, I will let you know right now we're registered at Bed Bath & Beyond. Please send towels. Um, you know, like stuff like that because I was so 
<laughs> you guys have got to chill out. It's a book. Like, please, the chapters that bothered them the most were in Locked Out of Heaven. There's a chapter called Empathy for the Devil, where two of the Power Brigade angels are debating the fact that Lucifer took his horde of demons home and did not. And while these two Power Brigade angels were locked out from the Shining Kingdom. So who is the bad guy? The creator? Or Lucifer, who protected his demon horde. And they're just debating, like, gee, who's the bad guy? That sent people to Twitter. They were just like, oh, oh my God. And then at the end, there is a um, uh, a biblical event that we all know regarding a parting of a certain sea, <laughs> where um, I describe it as a fey battle. So it happens, but humans take it as this is a biblical moment. But the fae, for the fae, it's a battle. So the humans say, oh, this is a a biblical thing. And the creator had it. But really, it's a fae battle. So I just, certain biblical things that have happened in human history are really fae moments. Mm -hmm. They are like, oh, this is blasphemous. And I'm like, you you understand this is a fantasy book, right, people? (laughs) I'm not saying this happened. This is not gospel. I'm saying this is just my interpretation. (laughs) It just didn't go over well, so I wound up on the blasphemy list. And um, at this point, I don't know if a bat is going to deliver, like, my excommunication from the Vatican. I don't know what happens. I'm waiting to find out, like, you know, I don't know if Lucifer shows up at my doorstep and is just like, dude, you're one of my brides now. So sorry. Uh I don't know if I have to sign something. Uh I'm waiting to find out. But as soon as (laughs) I do, I'll let everybody know. There you go. Um, You know, all I joke about is... They're still unlocked out of heaven. Wait till they get the kingdom come, because that's when I really poke the bear. Um, you know, it's gone from it's gone from funny to you know, hey, give me your home address. I want to send you pamphlets to people taking pictures, the guns of God taking a picture of a handgun with like my dad's birthday underneath it and sending it to me. So I've gone from funny to like threatening my life over this book. It, it's, mm, it's it's a book. really sad. That's all I say to people. So I, it's, it's so yeah. frightening, so frightening what people will do. Well, I, changing yeah. the subject a bit, how, you, and you brought this up a bit also, mm-hmm. how do martial arts assist your writing? That's helped me a lot with fight scenes. I love, my martial arts has helped me make my fight scenes as realistic as possible. So I will, um, I will usually take my phone, set it up on my little tripod and I will videotape all the fight scenes oh. and see if I can make it as realistic as possible. Because as much as I love my superhero movies, you know, I hope DC gets it right eventually. Um, but <laughs> I hate when it's just a fist going into a body part and then we just see a cape and you're just like, okay, wait, what happened? I know somebody got punched. I don't, I like to be able to think of myself in the moment and actually like in the middle of the fight or watching it happen and know. Oh, I can see everything. I don't like when it's just a close-up of a body part because then I can't, I don't know what they did. You know, you're sitting there going, okay, I think somebody got punched in the jaw. I don't, I don't really know. Or the person just falls and you're like, what did you just do? I, you know, that drives me nuts. So <laughs> what kind of martial scenes, arts um, moves do you use? I try to keep it as realistic as possible because what I've noticed over time, and I don't know if, you know, if anybody out there is familiar with a lot of the movies but we went from just bar fighting like in the movies to now everybody is the karate kid Uh you know and it's like everybody does these jump kicks I try to keep it more of what would realistically work because if you punch somebody with your fist you're going to break bones unless you're a superhero Uh you know Uh so I try to keep elbows and knee smashes and things a little more realistic rather than just a punch because like I said unless you're superman or wonder woman you're breaking you're breaking knuckles you're going to break these little bones your your hand has tiny little bones they're going to break so i try to keep things a little more realistic when i fight um same thing with the swords any weapons i do i try to make sure that it'll be as realistic as possible 
uh, you know, my husband has come outside before and he's seen the dog like on her hind legs. And I've got like a plastic sword and I'm like, Penelope, stay still. And he just walks back in the house and closes the door and he's like, don't hurt the dog. And he keeps oh, going because he's like, oh, I don't even want to know what's happening right now. <laughs> he's like, just, just okay, as long as everything's fine. It might like, be dangerous to be married to you. <laughs> yeah, he's a martial artist too. So he gets it. He's just, oh. there are days where he's like, I don't want to know. Mm-hmm. But um, I try to keep it realistic. Uh, there's usually no more than four people. When, you know, against some somebody, everything's small, like I said, not big sweeping scenes. So the reader can actually picture everything. I try to think of it as theater of the mind. I want you to be able to see it. Okay, that's, that's, it sounds like a brilliant way to do it. Um, can you also explain what cosplay is and why you cosplay? The best way I can explain cosplay is it's an expression of your fandom whatever that is mm-hmm. if you are uh if your favorite character is captain america whether you're a girl guy whatever you identify with it's how you would express it so if you want captain america to be steampunk from the steampunk era your costume may reflect that and you're just the love of your character that character of your hero that's how you're going to dress up and express it and You'll go to Comic Con, Galaxy Con, wherever it is, and that's who you are for the day. Mm-hmm. And it's just kind of your love. I'm I'm a huge Wonder Woman fan, Harley Quinn. I'll go dressed as these characters, and you embody them, and just take pictures with people and kind of meet your tribe. Oh. And that's that's what you do, whether you make them, uh, whether you purchase it, and you make one little thing from it. Mm-hmm. It's just you kind of getting that love for that character and expressing it as best you can. And that's what you kind of do. Lovely. It's a good description. Thank you. What is it about doing that that you love? Uh, I think it's the release. It's a way to take the pressure off. I think, uh, you know, I went, I've been to so many comic cons, so many galaxy cons. People are just able to kind of take down their inhibitions a little bit. And you're embodying that character, like I said, whether it's Harley, whether it's Catwoman, who, whomever it is, Joker, whatever. And they just kind of get to relax for a little bit. Mm-hmm. And the responsibilities of the day, all of it just melt away. And then there's, there's the artistic side. There's so many, especially at New York Comic Con, I can say, I've seen so many people go and drag uh, cross dress, whatever, you know, for the first time. And people are so accepting that they will go out of their way, especially when they see somebody, um, you know, maybe it's a transgender trying out that, that gender for the first time. People will go out of their way just to be like, you look really good. That's great. The wig looks good. This looks, whatever it is, they will go out of their way to just say something nice because you can tell it's that person's first time transitioning into that or stepping foot inside that world that maybe they've wanted to for so long, but this place is a safe space. It's lovely. You can just see it. And they're so happy that everybody is so accepting Mm -hmm. that it's just a beautiful place. And I think that's nice. Yeah. Well, how have comic books influenced your style of writing? Uh, I'm a big Chris Claremont fan, George Perez, Jim Steranko. Uh, all of these, Gail Gail Simone, they've all touched me in some way, especially Claremont, who I just think phenomenal. Uh, He's just, as far as I'm concerned, a genius, probably one of the best there is. But when I started, I've, I've read comic books my whole life, but especially Claremont, he made me care about the morally gray character, which I didn't even know that was a term until I started writing, you know, I didn't know, but kind of caring about the villain, especially the dark, the dark Phoenix saga. That was like my first, I actually care about this villain because it inhabited a hero's body. And so those, all those things kind of seeped into my writing without me really knowing. And I was influenced throughout the book because I like to leave Easter eggs. Like, mm-hmm. I don't like to tie everything up in a nice little bow. Mm-hmm. So something I did in book one might not come full circle until book five. And that's all comic book book influenced. Uh, yeah. Some of the motivations. 
Well, that's great. You know, I didn't. I didn't think about Jarbach, my lead man, being morally gray. I just kind of influenced him a lot uh, from Magneto. He's inspired by from the X Men. Like you might not agree with what he's doing, his methodology you wouldn't agree with, but he's really doing what he thinks is right for his people. And that's a lot of Magneto involved. Uh, you know, Queen Aurora, she's a little naive. She's got that streak in her. There's a little Wonder Woman in her in the sense of she wants what you know, she thinks there's still good in people, but it's not always going to end up right. You know, Serena, there's a little Harley Quinn in her. She's ride or die. You could be going off that cliff. The vehicle could be on fire and she still got pom-poms out going, you're doing great. This is so <laughs> good. And it's like, it's the girl you really want with her, but she's a little off the deep end. And she was inspired by my best friend in high school, but there's a little Harley in her where you're looking at her going, you're just seeing a Jack in the box playing in your head this whole time. Like the car is on fire. We are not winning. This, this team is down by a hundred points and there's two seconds left in the game. And she's like, but we're going to win. And you're like, you're really out there, aren't you? But you would do anything for her. Like there's, there's always an influence of some comic book character. That sounds great. In my guys. That's a great and so explanation. I think that's the whole thing. What a good yeah. explanation. And on that, on that line, how much research did you do for your books and how many books do you have out now? What's the series total so far? Book six, forgive us comes out June 16th. Oh. That's book six, but I have, as of right now, I have five because I have a novella, um, Fire, Ice, Acid, and Heart, which is the dragon novella. That's out mm. as well. So there's <sighs> six right now. Forgive us. We'll make it, um, we'll make it seven. Mm -hmm. So there's that. Uh, to be honest, I, the most research went into my dragons. Oh, I can't say mm. I sat there doing like, and originally for book one, there wasn't a lot of research. Book two, there was a tremendous amount because I went into uh, Tudor England and I mm. took a Tudor etiquette class and I did all these things to make sure Tudor England was right on because the only thing I knew about Tudor England was um, to show the Tudors. And I'm pretty sure Jonathan Reese Myers had nothing to do with uh, King Henry VIII. And I don't think that was accurate. Loved watching it. I'm not, I don't think he was the great, you know, King Henry VIII that we all thought. I had no idea but, there was any such thing as a Tudor etiquette class. That's there wonderful. Is. Yeah. Um, That's you can wonderful. Take it online. Oh. From Great Britain. <laughs> I learned so much about it and <laughs> I wrote it all in there. I did like how they ate, washing your hands, um, if you were upper class before because they ate kind of family style. So you'd have to wash your hands in, in front of everybody and show them that you did it before you ate because they ate with their hands. If they did have utensils, uh, it was silver and they carried it around in a pouch mm -hmm. because that was a sign Great. of having money. Mm -hmm. So it was like things like that, um, placing the napkin over your left shoulder. Mm. It was because you'd wipe it here, you know, over the shoulder, things like that. Um, I studied all of that to make sure I wrote the first manuscript in Old English. Everybody spoke in Old English in Tudor. Really? And that took me forever. And then my editor was like, are you crazy? When I handed it to her. <laughs> she was like mm -hmm. both my editors cleet barrett smith was my developmental editor and i love cleet he is one of the best there is laughed at me because he was like nobody can read this danny he's yeah like, nobody's gonna sit Aww. through this many <laughs> lies days privies he's like get rid of it yeah and you put so much effort into that but i i'm sure they're right because you don't want to lose your audience on the second book <laughs> i wouldn't have read it but i thought it was like i was like, I'm so authentic yeah he was just like get rid of it he's like what are you doing? It, it had to go. And I, they were all right. Christina was right. They were right. But I really thought like I was just transporting everybody back to Tudor England. And this is one of the examples when an author gets so out there that you have to yank them back to earth and go, mm -hmm. what is wrong with you? Yeah, I gave you. Uh, yeah, it had to go. Uh, so yeah. that was extensive research. My dragon took the longest time to do because mm -hmm. I didn't want Neil Tyson, whatever, to call me up and be like, yo, these dragons are not real. Uh, so I worked with a mechanical engineer, a physics professor, and a uh, veterinarian to make my dragons oh, plausible. It, I always joke if I was on Mythbusters, I just want to be plausible. I don't have to be confirmed. Fabulous. be plausible. So we a, figured a out. veterinarian? Yes, my vet. Um, Dr. Gil Stanzione of Dakota Vet in uh, White Plains in Westchester, New York. 
I walked in one day and I was like, I want to make a dragon. And I just remember him taking his glasses off, putting them down and looking at me. And he went, what, Danielle? He was just, you know, because he was used to me asking like off the wall questions. And I said, I want to make a fire breather, an acid breather, and an ice breather. And he went, and, and how are we doing that? And I said, <laughs> if I build them from the digestive system out, just hear me out. And he went, okay. And so I said, here's the bacteria. This is what I want to do. And when I was done, he went, this actually isn't half bad. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, that's a start. So I built them from this idea that if it was in their digestive system, the oral defenses could come out. Mm-hmm. And that's how I started. And I kind of took it from a nursing background mm-hmm. and went that way. And then built it outwards. Uh, I worked with Pandy Van, my dragon illustrator, and then worked on, okay, now that I've got the bacteria, I've got the gases, how do I get it out through the mouth? And built it that way. So like uh, my fire breathers have gas bladders on the side of their uh, their necks. So I had plating built. So it would be protected and I did it like a fire billow. So one with methane, one with hydrogen, it would come out through little um, fistulas and then get a click of the back teeth the back teeth would be covered in flint oh rock you know and that would give us the spark so there'd be denticles in the mouth so that's how it wouldn't you know they wouldn't explode things like that um acid breathers would be a fistula like a komodo dragon through the teeth and a bite you know so we just kind of wow. built it up wow and that that took me a long time then i worked on flying that's where i worked with the mechanical engineer physics professor from westchester community college and that was the midterm for the students. They had to figure out, could a dragon fly? How big does it have to be? So my dragons are about the size of giraffes, maybe 20 feet uh, tall, not huge, can only carry one to two fey. That's it. We're not 747 dragons. And they don't take <laughs> off like Superman. They've mm-hmm. got to glide. So they jump, catch a thermal current. They have membranes over their eyes, like a shark. And so they could still see. And then we glide. So it was things like that that we had to do down to the trabecular bones. Uh, you know, we really worked on it to make sure that the dragons were plausible. Like, okay, we could see this and, you know, built it out from there. So they took me the longest. Yeah. Well, wow. That That's is amazing one of the research. most fascinating things I've ever heard. <laughs> and And I have to ask you how you even get on to writing your books when you're so ensconced in research. And I also have to ask you, is was the old English version of your book the worst mistake you've ever done as an author? Oh no, I've done much worse mistakes. That was <laughs> that was nothing compared to the mistakes I've made. I've made so many more. Um I handwrite everything because once again I didn't know what I was doing. So I thought Everybody handwrites. Uh, I hand wrote everything first because then I always had paper with me and I was so scared I would lose something that I got in this paranoia of handwriting. Because then I was like, oh, then I never lose it. Like my computer doesn't fry, doesn't get hacked into, you know. So uh-huh. I just had another version. So I started with that. Then I go to the computer and that's where the like first round of edits starts. Uh, so I have tons of journals. But uh, biggest mistakes I've made I've fallen for every scam out there. You name you name the scam, I've fallen for it. You know, mm. oh, I'm I'm an author life coach. Okay. You know, because I didn't know what I was doing, so I thought I needed that validation of somebody telling me, oh, this is good. Mm-hmm. You know, I always thought like I needed that extra because I'm right. not a trained author. So I thought if somebody was like, I have a degree in creative writing, that makes them better than me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I fell for that. Yeah. Oh, and uh, what what would you say is the best advice you received as an author? Don't write by committee. Uh-huh. Don't try to write a book to to please everyone. Whatever you write is not going to please everybody. Learn that there is no book out there for the world. Uh-uh. You'll find your audience. Stick with that. Write the book that you want to read because somebody else wants to read it too. And don't go mm-hmm. on good news. Oh. Yeah, that's Don't good advice. Right. Um, can you describe a little bit more of your writing process? How long do you research before you actually sit down to write the book? Or do you do it all at the same time? 
And um, what else? Do you have a time of day that you write? Um, and are, how disciplined are you? I write pretty much all the time. That's why I always have my, um, my journals with me. I have to have music or some sound. RuPaul's Drag Race, The Housewives. Somebody's got to be yelling in the background. I can't write in silence. Oh, mm. interesting. Too many voices in my head. They take over. So I need some kind of noise. Uh, I like to write. As I'm writing, I do a playlist on Spotify of what the emotional crescendo and the journey of the characters oh. and the overall theme of the book is. And I keep like that what? going. Um, so for for Birth of a Succubus, which is volume two, I have probably about 14, 15 songs starting from Graham when you first meet him to the end of his journey playing like the first song is Ricky Nelson's Traveling Man. <laughs> really? That's the first song when you first meet Graham because he's technically emotionally um, disconnected and he's collecting succubi women. So that song, huh. you know, he's got a woman <laughs> in every port. He's got a woman behind glass. That yeah. made sense to me. So I try to like find songs that kind of have hidden meanings and keep it going. And then I'll usually release the the playlist on Instagram for people, you know, so mm-hmm. they can listen to it as they read and kind of see maybe where I was going with things. That's fun. So I will That's do that. That's so fun for the, for the reader. Yeah. It's something that, you know, then they can kind of discuss, but. I don't have a time of day. It's kind of, I can write whenever. Sometimes I'll keep a notebook uh, by my bed because it'll hit. That's happened yeah. to me. Uh, Indiga, who is, who's turned into a reader favorite. She came into my head at 3 a.m. in the morning, you know, halfway through book four. And Cherry Bomb was blasting in my head. And she was like, get up, write my story. And she was never somebody I planned on writing. So it's always been kind of something new. Uh, Same thing with the bishops. They turned into villains and I just needed a name. And they were, you know, it was somebody that had given me problems throughout my martial art career. And so So I was kind of doing that. that. Doing the handwriting and having the notebooks and the paper is a really efficient way for you to write. Sounds like. Yeah, not inefficient at all. You always have it. You're not going to get up and go open up the computer and do all that if you've got it right by the bed, right? You just do it in the bed. Yeah, sit there. I'll just grab it and and start going. And, and then I it becomes order. And then it becomes a bit like automatic writing. It's coming to you, and it's just going through you. That's yep. really wonderful. What would you like our listeners to have today as their main takeaway? Um, I think the main takeaway is that. No matter what plan you have for yourself, if you listen to the universe, I think in general, the the universe throws little pebbles at you. And if you don't listen, it throws a rock. If you still don't listen, it throws a boulder, brick, and then eventually some big old rock comes thrashing crashing through your window. Just listen Mm -hmm. and eventually you'll be led down the right road. Because I really thought I was going to be an NP, a physician assistant. I had my life planned out. And then mm-hmm. it was just like, oh, isn't that sweet? You think that's what's going to happen. Watch this. Mm-hmm. You just have to kind of yeah. keep an open mind. You never know what's going to happen. You don't know what's going to happen with the people you meet and the impression they will leave upon you or what they can lead you to the next step. Because I really thought this is where it was going to go. And I've reinvented myself. I don't even know how many times. And I finally mm-hmm. feel like everything I've done has led me to this point because without the step before, I wouldn't have gotten here. Mm-hmm. So I don't think you can You're... sit and say, oh, I wasted this time. I wasted this. Uh, I'm here this late in life. Mm-hmm. It's like, yeah. no, you don't know. You wouldn't have been ready for this. Like, I would never have been this where I am. Like, if you had taken me back 20 years and been like, here's birth of the Fay, Here's all the inspiration. Go. My 20 year old would have been like, what the hell are you going to do with this? I'm going to compete. I think I would have Mm -hmm. wasted the opportunity. Yeah. Beautiful. Well said. Thank you. Yeah. Inspiring. Really well said. Thank you so much, Danielle. This has been a wonderful, wonderful conversation. And I so admire your agency. Uh, 
Our guest today on Late Boomers has been Danielle Orsino, fantasy author of the Birth of the Fae series. Check out her website, and it has beautiful book covers on it, mm-hmm. at Birth of the Fae, that's F-A-E dot com. And you can follow her on Instagram at Birth of the Fae Novel. Thanks again, Danielle. Thank you so much, ladies. I appreciate this. Thanks. We appreciate you. We want to remind you, our listeners, to follow us on Instagram at Late Boomers and at I am Kathy Worthington and at I am Mary Elkins. And please subscribe to our new YouTube channel, Late Boomers Podcast, because there you can see Danielle speaking to us live in full cosplay in her beautiful outfit. So also please subscribe to our podcast on your favorite platform so you don't miss an episode. We hope you are inspired to do some fantasy reading today. Thanks again, Danielle. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us on Late Boomers, the podcast that is your guide to creating a third act with style, power, and impact. Please visit our website and get in touch with us at lateboomers.biz. If you would like to listen to or download other episodes of Late Boomers, go to EWNpodcastnetwork.com. This podcast is also available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and most other major podcast sites. We hope you make use of the wisdom you've gained here and that you enjoy a successful third act with your own style, power, and impact.